Bam. Hello, this is Attil Haidu, and you're watching the Break It Down Show. Yeah, that's right. We got Attila on the show. Attila has been on a couple of times in the past. If you guys haven't followed the show for the years and years we've been around, he uh, started a company called Stelvio and it went to an accelerator and they were working on trying to use AI to cure uh, an awful disease called geoblastoma. It's a disease that you've heard about in the news. People die from it fairly regularly. And along the way, like this journey of <clears throat> we're using AI. And when Attila, Attila started this, it wasn't the most common thing to hear. Like, what do you mean you're using AI to discover protocols that are worthy of research? So let me back up and have Attila uh, talk a little bit about this era of his life. And and you're incredible. Look, you're, every time you talk to me, I'm like, oh, my God, you just know everything about this industry from the business side, sales side to the science side. Yeah, thank you for that, Pete. So you're right. Uh, we, we had a uh, platform technology that used... Um, AI machine learning to look at the different um, epigenetic patterns that were representing a, a, a cancer stem cell state. And because we're basically taking pictures of inside the nucleus of a cell. So imagine instead of thinking of that, imagine a satellite taking a picture of the earth and imagine mm -hmm. the earth is the nucleus. And so with this, this kind of technology is not possible from the human eye because in the, inside the nucleus. So imagine taking a picture of the earth from a satellite and you can see all the bumps and the valleys and the rivers and the streams and the blades of grass. And so that's similar to what's inside the nucleus of a cell. So each and every cell has a, a unique uh, identity or a genetic signature. And there's certain um, signatures that a cancer stem cell has, for example. And so our technology is all about inducing this differentiation of cancer stem cells uh, to be non-tumorigenic. And that's how we were using AI machine learning to um, record that signature and see the changes in which drugs were driving those changes. So as I said, it's not possible with the human eye. And so this is where we really rely on the technology to uh to get us the results that we were looking for how long ago was this that you developed this so we the the interesting thing is that the company was founded in 2017 and then as you said we uh joined the indie bio accelerator in in san francisco and then um we partnered with um sanford burnham prebis uh, medical discovery institute for the um, the technology, um, and it was also developed by uh, uh, David Andrews at the University of uh, Toronto in Canada, and so we actually licensed the IP, or actually had it assigned, because uh, the uh, chief scientific officer that I hired was one of the uh, co-inventors, and and so when someone joins a company like that in that level then they assign all the, the, the patents that they own uh, to the company, which, which was actually a huge struggle because I think um, just doing that was, that's all I focused on for three months. And because generally speaking, Sanford Burnham was very open to doing that. They're very open to drug discovery and they're very open to licensing out tech, as are a lot of universities in, in um, the states and so as you know i'm canadian and the, the canadian universities are not the same level there's u of t is is probably the best one in canada but they're not the same level as an mit or or, mm -hmm. Burnham or any of those institutes or um so that part was seamless but the the assignment was not so seamless and so when i eventually did that that was 2017 and we actually um, had proven that technology worked through a pilot type of program. And so the idea again was to turn these, um, stop these cancer stem cells from dividing and becoming more cancer stem cells. So, um, so it was, it was a paradigm changing type of technology. 
and it was only enabled through AI. And so, which is really fascinating um, when you couple that, because generally speaking, it's my understanding that these, like AI itself is open source. Mm. The challenge is actually getting it to work for a specific technology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So when you're talking about this, you're talking about paradigm shifts in, in what's possible. And that sounds like you're on the way, like you just have to get through the growing nexus. And then all of a sudden, you, you know, you're not just solving the problem of geoblastoma, but you're, you're curing a lot of diseases, but, but that isn't, that isn't what happened. No, no. So I think the reality is with biotech, the, there, there is ebbs and flows and believe it or not right now, um, there's been a, uh, I would say another ebb. Um, it was primarily driven through COVID, and so when yeah. I was when I when I was in the area, the platform technologies were were not considered something valuable because there was no particular asset or drug that was owned by the company. So we had a platform to develop or discover a new drug, but not a new drug. So COVID changed that. So I'll give you a perfect ex example is Abcelera. So Abcelera, the CEO of Abcelera became a billionaire overnight because of the, their platform that they developed to help companies like Eli Lilly develop COVID therapeutics that were used to prevent people from going into acute respiratory distress, further complications of that obviously are, are you can't breathe and you die or you go into cardiac arrest. So, so he became a billionaire overnight. He it's, it's a lot of times these are, this is all timing mm -hmm. and because it was COVID and, and the world needed solutions. So Eli Lilly actually used Upseller's platform to get the very first approved COVID antibody treatment and presidents and everyone um, uh, have used that. And since then, Pfizer have developed um, small molecule therapeutics, which is different because an antibody, right? An antibody is yeah. injectable and uh, Paxlovid was, is Pfizer's. And th those, those treatments are, 10 billion, $30 billion in sales. And, and so it's, it's amazing how the, the dy dynamic has changed. So for me, I, um, I, I failed to keep the company operational through not being able to find, uh, investors that would believe in the idea. Mm. Had I come like, prior to COVID, then it might have been a completely different story because the um, uh, the technology should have been used to develop new COVID treatments. And it wasn't, um, to my knowledge. So um, unfortunately, um, it, because Paxlovid was, was originally developed by uh, Merck, and I think a lot mm. of people are going down the same road and there's a bit of copying going on sometimes and stealing. And as you know, some of the, um, the intellectual property became such a hot topic in um, especially uh, the United States where companies like Moderna and um, BioNTech who partnered with Pfizer, their technologies were developed using government funding. Mm and the NIH, for example. So the NIH owned the technology and they funded them to um, develop these mRNA vaccines, which as you know, have saved um, billions of people from getting uh, severe disease and millions of people's lives. And so, of course, there's, there's companies like Acuitas that some of the most fascinating stories we've seen in the past where companies like Acuitas have, have stated that you know, they're the ones that actually came up with the technology. So there's constant lawsuits going on now and, and who actually developed it. And 
so the key there with Acuitas, which was a very, very interesting story, it was an article in Forbes that was published, but the, the, um, the guy that developed that technology um, claimed, amongst others, that they had developed the sort of the lipid nanoparticle soap mm -hmm. and that would enable the mRNA to get inside the cell. Um, and then, of course, there's the famous um, Hungarian um, Katerina, I um, can't remember her, her last name exactly, but she she also had a, a big role in developing that technology. Mm. And, and she actually went to um, uh, the CEO of Moderna. She wanted to work for, for them, uh, Stefan Benzel, and, and wanted a job. But for whatever reason, he turned her down. So she ended up at BioNTech. And we all know what happened at BioNTech. So they have their own mRNA vaccine using her technology. Right. So timing seems to be, uh, sorry, everything. Um, um, and I just missed out on that timing. Yeah, and it's so crazy because you're ahead of it, right? And, and I remember one of the things was trying to explain to very smart people, very successful investors, why your technology, which was really on the forefront, why it was gonna do the things you said it did. And then when you proved it, like, hey, this actually works, it doesn't, uh, it, it seems like, okay, you've cracked the code. Like you've gone to the accelerator, you're meeting these investors, they're gonna get it, but that that isn't what happened. But it did happen for somebody else. Right, exactly. Yeah. It's a hard, it's a bitter pill to swallow. <laughs> yeah. And sorry for bringing it up, but it's just, I, I think it's important that we understand how, like my buddy Phil, he has ALS, right? And and uh, he's going to die from it. And so we're trying to figure out how to figure out how to figure what has to be figured so we can get to figuring out the actual solution. And there's a lot of parts in there that have to be done. And there you got regulations that are in the way. There's for sure money in the way. And everybody wants to deal with it. But it's the pace of the disease is so fast, like geoblastoma, that it's very hard to have anybody be the, the, the flag bearer for ALS because they're gone by the time they can build up that influence in the community. And that's a big thing. Like when someone who has ALS is known and they're like, hey, I need $250,000 right now to get it over to this spot. Okay, you can get it because you're the guy. But six months later, that person doesn't exist anymore. So you have all these problems. And it, and it seems like AI is going to be the answer for this, but I don't know, is it? Well, it's definitely a tool in the toolbox. So there's there's certain diseases where uh, it can be a, a very useful, and there's certain diseases where it cannot. Be. So I'll give you another example. Yeah. So um, you probably know who Chip Wilson is. Sure. He was the founder of Lululemon. And I, I actually met him um, at, at his book signing because he, he actually wrote, and I would recommend this book, is uh, Little Black Stretchy Pants, but he wrote a book about how he built his empire. Mm. And so a guy like that has immense resources. And, and he, um, uh, as you know, is a billionaire, but yeah. he has lots of different businesses, real estate, and um, uh, obviously Lil Lemon, he's no longer a part of that, but I think he's on the board. But I don't know if you know this, but he has muscular dystrophy. Oh, wow. Yeah. So, so, so he actually said, look, I'm going to give $200 million to um, smart people and smart companies that can sort of come up with uh, get drugs in the clinical trials for muscular dystrophy and yeah. sort of form his own accelerator. And in a way, and I looked at that and things like muscular dystrophy, and I don't know a lot about ALS, but things like muscular dystrophy are um, a genetic disease. Mm. So to me, that screams um, gene therapy. Right. You're basically, you're taking um, out the bad genes. It's a genetic disease. You can't really treat a genetic disease. Um, you can, but it's not going to cure it. And right. so... So gene therapy is involved, and and I don't know the extent to which AI is used in gene therapy, but honestly, like it's now everywhere. Think about Chat GPT. That's 
AI. Yeah. Think about what chat GPT is going to do to the world in, in the future. And so there's no doubt in my mind it's, it's, it's going to change our world. And uh, I was just at um, the Sotheby's uh, International Realty Global Networking Event in, in Las Vegas where 3,000 people from Sotheby's um, descended on Vegas to uh, listen to TED type talks and um, learn from each other and explore ways to grow our businesses. And one of the talk, one of the speakers was Indra Nui. Indra Nui was the former CEO of Pepsi. Hmm. And some of the things that she said were really incredible because um, she said that uh, AI is going to take over the real estate business. And she said, She's always a, she's a lifelong learner like me. It's like I'm always learning. And, and she said basically she was encouraging the audience to, to study machine learning and, and AI, take a course in it because it's going to change our lives. And you want to be ahead of the curve versus behind the curve. So she um, said, look, AI or chat GPT is going to change the real estate industry completely. And in a way, I, um, she has a point, but in, in another way, I disagree with her because, to be honest, real estate is not just about the transaction. Real estate is about, uh, and the way I describe it is what another speaker, uh, Will Guadara, who his restaurant, uh, restaurant in New York became the number one restaurant in the world. So he's a Michelin star restaurant uh restaurant tour but he's also wrote this book called unreasonable hospitality so unreasonable hospitality means being in flow and being present and um excluding everything around you so that you are totally immersed in what's in front of you and that's the that's the fine dining rest the, the michelin restaurant experience and it, it, it's the same for real estate unreasonable hospitality has to be that way because if you're not in tune with the client and what that customer wants, then, then you're not going to be successful. So, no. um, so there's a role for, I'm sure there's a role for chat GPT and, and perhaps maybe doing paperwork or, or, but the human, there has to be a human interaction. We can't have robots walking around and doing showings. There's also, but we can't have robots walking around um, delivering fine dining courses to, to, um, to restaurant goers. Right. In, another example that Will showed, shared with us is that he, again, this, think of this as a Michelin three-star restaurant and the type of experience he, he had, um, people fly in from Los Angeles. That's all they were doing was just going to restaurants and they were going to fly home, fly in, fly home. And so, he, he had served them, I think they were on their fourth course and he overheard them. And this is unreasonable hospitality. He, he overheard them saying, you know, one of the things I really wish I would have had while I'm here in New York City is, is actually a New York City hot dog. And <laughs> so, you know, what Will does, he's the, the restaurant owner. He goes out to the street vendor and buys it. And he brings it in, and he cuts it up, and he plates it, and he puts these nice garnishes on it, and, and he serves it. And 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 the 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 two customers were just blown away. They just, oh my god, this is the best hot dog I've ever eaten <laughs> my whole life. And uh, um, the that's that's unreasonable hospitality. You have to be present, and and yeah. so so I guess Indra's point is is. Um, maybe well taken because could you use AI to actually put a microphone in, in the restaurant and yeah, maybe conversations and also chat GPT sends a text to the restaurant and then maybe, I don't know. Um, but yeah, there's definitely, um, uh, there's, you know, we're all starting to get pitched by robots. Now, if you haven't seen them yet, just give it a minute, but you see these pitches come in. It's like, Oh, Hey Pete, I was looking at your show. Oh my gosh. It's so good. I'd love to know if you want to, and then, you know, the thing that they want me to buy from them or whatever it is. And it's super gentle and soft, but it starts with a lie. Uh, and so I respond back and I go, which episode was it? 
you know, because look, if they've got an interesting pitch, I want to hear it. But if it's a robot, then no. And and if they haven't got the time, and they're just really spamming me in a creative way, then then you know, screw off. And so we're going to see more of that, right? And you're right, like that pitch to hey, list your house with me, or have you thought about buying this house that looks perfect for you, or whatever that thing is. You still need a human to to be trusted. I don't trust the emails I get for the most part, unless I know I'm having a like you and I can send an email and you know it's me and I, I know it's you. But if I don't know you and you send something and you're asking me for something, I'm like, that's a robot, like a default now. So there's even further distance from humanity with AI. And I'm not against AI. What I'm saying is, is that if you can figure out how to humanize your AI interactions, then then you probably are going to be ahead of your peers. Or if you can turn your AI, you know, your AI program into something that that helps you write better. You know, like just write what you would normally write, give it to the robot and say, make this, you know, um, sound like Chaucer or whoever it's going to be. They can do that now. And so you're talking about things that are useful because you don't have to come up with the whole concept. I use AI to uh, develop an idea. Here's the thing. And then I kind of proofread from that and correct. And then I run it through again. And and it's it's laborious, but I'm learning how to use it. And there's value there. Yeah, absolutely. And that's one of the things that um, Brad Nelson, who's the chief marketing officer of, of Suffity, said is, is that that's being used now in um, writing, like listing uh, descriptions into real estate. Because right yeah. now, somebody has to sit down and write, you know, stunning oceanfront yes. home with, uh, you know, birds chirping and access to golf courses and all that but it, i mean now chat gpt does that but you're right yeah you know, there has to be some sort of proofreading because but if it gets it 90 percent there yeah it's done and then you do a couple edits and, and things um so it definitely has a place and yeah. you know especially um um pattern recognition and i'm sure with your background you're probably uh aware of all the facial recognition that's going on and, and all that stuff in the analysis of patterns yeah pat people's movements and tracking certain people and yeah what they they may or may not be doing and and so um like i've seen some things that are just amazing like um and it's all ai driven I, yeah you know autonomous driving vehicles that's that's Definitely AI. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And th and those things work. There's a dude on Twitter who shows his car, his Tesla, driving every day with zero corrections. He's done this for months now. And this is San Francisco to somewhere else, all the way down to L.A., right? So this is complex things. This is not like I'm on country roads just giving it a shot. It's happening. And every time it happens, it's getting better and better and better, which is also AI. And, and it's amazing. I want to go back to the Stelvio thing. You, you went through an accelerator, and, and we all have this kind of belief that if you go through an accelerator, hey, you come out accelerated. But that wasn't what I saw when I was uh, working with those guys and and understanding how they were trying to help com companies la launch. And I think you had the same experience because you went through it, where you come out and like, yes, I went through this. Yes, I've sacrificed a piece of my company, but but what did I get for it? Yeah, I, I think there's there's both good and bad in accelerators. And um, I mean, I think that they have the ability to, um, to help companies grow and they have some sort of, they have some expertise that they can share, but there's also some really, um, dark negative things about accelerators and which people have to be wary for, because first of all, you end up giving up a lot of your company for, um, a little investment and, a lot of these accelerators, they, it's a numbers game. Mm. If I make a thousand investments, then a um, hundred of them work. So it's almost um, like the Pink Floyd, um, you know, meat grinder, mm -hmm. um, where you're, they're just grinding out people or putting people into the grinder and they come out ground beef in some cases. And, and maybe that's sellable. Um, but for me, I found personally, I found it, uh, the relationships and the, and the, um, the environment was abusive and disrespectful and mm. almost to the point where 
they had no idea who I was. They had, they, they had no idea. Like, I mean, I'm, which is no personal connection. I don't think they knew how clinical trials worked. I don't think they knew, um, for example, the concept of what it takes to bring a drug to market from uh, inception. Yeah. So their vision, for example, was it's a three month accelerator and um, we need you to, to get a drug that can be tested in patients and proven in three months. That's what? <laughs> so that's, that's completely delusional. That's completely delusional. And some of it too was the lack of an authenticity that I saw where I, I, I saw companies that they were, I suppose, maybe more preferred, um, like people using, you know, and I, I truly believe in the idea because I think that's another entire show in itself because I truly believe we as a species don't need to kill animals for food in the future because we can make, um, we can make food from stem cells. And mm -hmm. so many particular companies, that's the technology they were, were developing was how do you make fish from right. stem, stem cells in the lab. So basically lab grown meat or lab, we don't even call it meat anymore because it's not meat. Um, and, and the authenticity wasn't there. It was like, I was, you know, we were all on stage doing our big pitches in, in the opera house in San Francisco and they were actually showing video footage of them actually consuming, you know, at a tasting with some nice, you know, Chablis and some Chardonnay, the, their product. And clearly that, <laughs> clearly that wasn't true. That wasn't the case. That was, that was some, you know, um, Captain Highliner <laughs> repackaged. <Yeah. laughs> and, 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 and so it was all phony. And so they're supporting that. So it's, that to me is like, you know, it's a bitter pill to swallow when you see that. And it's in, 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 in the meantime, they don't know anything about um, real drug discovery in the process and how long it takes because, you know, COVID changed a lot of things because, you know, we went to um, Operation Warp Speed where that's, that's how you, you throw billions of dollars into something you can, but the amount of money they're investing in companies, you know, accelerators normally are like $100,000 or $250,000 and they take 8% of your company. So $250,000 is, is some people don't even get out of bed for that. So mm. it's, it's a bit delusional to think that you can actually um, create a prototype or a drug that works in three months with $250,000. And so the experience for me was actually, you know, I left my family behind and um, uh, moved to California, um, was, was actually quite depressing and, and quite disrespectful and abusive because it was, it was, I felt like it was a meat grinder that, and they didn't understand how the process really worked. Yeah. Um, so to me, it was a, the only thing that, that ended up as a positive from that is I ended up in San Diego at the J labs location. And that was, that's a completely different environment. That is like, that to me felt like I was coming home, um, mm. you know, robotics and all sorts of drug development. And it was sort of Melinda Richter is someone that you should, um, try to interview. She's a, um, wonderful, amazing human being mm. and has the, huge network went through a life altering experience herself and, and where she was, um, uh, I think she was traveling in a remote location and all of a sudden she came and she got sick and then went to the doctor and the doctor said, well, you know, we don't know what you have and we think you can die. Mm -hmm. And, and so then she didn't settle for that. So she went to another, another hospital in, in a remote location and they said the same thing. And, um, obviously she ended up surviving, but that changed her, 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 I guess, I guess whenever people have near death experiences, they have a completely different vision of their life afterwards. That yeah. 
obviously unless you go through that. So hers was actually creating this, this um, ecosystem of biotechs that would share space and collaborate with each other and ex have exposure to different, you know, all the critical parts of a, a, a ecosystem that works in drug development at various stages. Much, much different. Much, and so to me that was um, a huge difference. So we moved in there and I loved it. And again, I would have stayed there um, indefinitely. <laughs> This is the life of a real estate agent. And so yeah, you're so connected. You're so connected. Um, Melinda Richter, I'm going to I'm gonna get back to you on that because I definitely want to try to talk to her. The, the reason why I bring up this whole accelerator thing, I mean, in the case you guys missed it, he just said that Finless Foods did not create a product. They bought a product and acted like it was their product. We yeah. had those guys on the show. And, yeah. you know, you're like excited for them and you're perpetuating a lie because – you're trusting that they actually know how to do this, but one of the problems they have was oxygenating the meat so right. that it would stay alive. And they're, they're like, it's really hard to do. We haven't figured out how to do it past, I think it was like a millimeter, you know, and you're talking like an inch of fish, that, that's just not gonna work. You can't have 90% of your fish not be oxygenated and dying. And I don't know where they've gotten with that. And the same thing with Prelis Bio was another company we worked with then. Yeah. And it's it's hard to get them to talk openly about where they're at with their process. And they said they were going to have something for us in five years. It has been five years, and I still can never get them to talk to me. So I fear that their progress is stalled too, partly because it seems like for me from the outside, they would run you through this cycle. You, know, you get a really great pitch deck that had been gone through a couple of times, but the actual thing you did, it wasn't any better because it can only go so fast. And to think that you can develop a drug in three months, maybe sometime in the future, sure, but you can't necessarily get it approved. And that involves, that involves, I mean, lobbying and getting in front of lawmakers to be able to say, yeah, we've got this drug. We'd like to start sticking it inside of people. That's just not easily done. Even if you can create the thing in three months, it's going to take you six years to make the connections on Capitol Hill to be able to be allowed to even have the conversation about, starting the process of getting it legal to stick that thing in somebody's arm. Yeah, like normally the drug development process is like 10 years. And so, and then once you actually have um, from inception to all the way through clinical trials and regulatory approval, it's 10 years, uh, not three months. And so, right. um, and then normally the patent life of, of these kind of new molecules or new chemical entities as they're called, is 20 years. So you only have 10 years to recover your cost. So in the other thing that people have to understand is that it, it is a business. Yeah. And there has to be, um, it has to be a profitable well, business if it's going to survive and have sustainable advantage. And so part of the, um, the challenge there is recovering that the R and D and, and, you know, when, when companies are established, like the Pfizer's and the Merck's and the J&J's, they have a roughly, um, you know, roughly 10% of their uh, net sales is allocated to R&D. But when you're just a startup, <laughs> it it's close to 100%. Yeah. And and so it, it does take a long time. And, and um uh, Joe Demazi is probably the, the most, the most, um, the most uh, famous one out of Tufts University, and so he now predicts the average drug cost to bring to market is two point eight billion dollars. Two point eight billion. Yeah, and the wow. failure rate is ninety percent. So oh we, my goodness! So have, really, it's way more than that. Yeah. So, we, but he's actually calculated the cost of failures. Oh, okay. So he's calculated that nine out of 10 drugs fail. So again, this is where the accelerator idea is like, it's more than delusional. <laughs> <laughs> it's more than delusional. It's, it's absolutely like, uh, it's impossible. So how, how much does popularity play into this too? Like if you're, you know, their golden child, whether you're capable or not, does, does that happen in these things? Of course it does. Of course it does. Of course. Yeah, you know, I guess people that are willing to fake it 
until they make it. I mean, um, you know, that's supported. Yeah. Uh, lots of companies are doing that. Lots of companies. Like the other one that came through there, um, same accelerator was the, I can't remember the exact name, Zyme, um, not Zymeworks, but um, they actually used um, molecular biology to um, make like, um products like film and things that they i can't remember the exact same um company but these are the guys that went and did an ipo and um bought another company and when they um the, when they actually went and did their um the ceo went up in front of all the workers and, and the staff and said, you know here's the um future sales, all the future sales were from the company that they bought. Oh. So then that meant that <laughs> they had zero sales. Yeah. And then they yeah. went, did, then they went and did a $2 billion IPO. And then the next, like within months, the stock was like trading at zero. Right. And they got bought out for like 180 million. So, so, Imagine how the shareholders would have felt at you oh. know, a, 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 a company that had a market cap of two billion and now it's worth 180 million. They just lost 90% of everything. Yeah, yeah. And people's lives are, are ruined, but that's the game. It's, um, uh, you know, it, it was completely phony. It's yeah. the same thing with Elizabeth Holmes. She's still not in prison. <laughs> still after all this time you yeah. know she did it oh my god i remember i remember this whole thing going down and i'm like there's no way they're ever going to put this lady in jail maybe someday they do but yeah. but she's already made all the money and and yeah they're going to recoup some of it or they did but she's already a multimillionaire. you know she can go yeah. around and say and raise it's ridiculous it's just like, there, yeah lance armstrong winning seven tour de france and and you know he made hundreds of millions of dollars, and then you know eventually the um, uh, World Anti-Doping Agency came after him, and so did um, uh, the U.S. Um, uh, doping um, guy, which is named Travis Tiger. And you yeah. know those guys show up at your house. They they you know they pull a re their revolver out of the of the holster, put it on the table, and and say, if you lie to me, it's not going to end well for you. Yeah, and so. If you remember that story, uh, Lance was actually, um, they dropped the case on Lance, probably because he has so much um, star power and connection. And then yeah. so they went after him in a civil suit and it was like, it was peanuts. I think he settled for like five, $10 million or something. They wanted a yeah. hundred million out, out of him, but you know, yeah. but he, you know, he made his money already. He made his money already, yeah. Is there a better way to approach this on the, like, so when I don't like to use the word big pharma, it's like big pharma, big ag. Yes, there was a problem with companies get too big, but that is like a political charge thing. Cause I don't know what medium sized pharma is. I don't know what, you know, boutique pharma is. So let's try to like, just be realistic about, we need the Pfizer's and the J and J's of the world because they have resources and they can do things like, Hey, Attila, we're going to buy your company. Cause we believe in it. We're going to turn it into something. But this, this, um, 10, you know, 20 year, 10 year process doesn't quite work. Is there a better way to do this? Is there a way that we should be doing? Is anybody doing it right? And, and at a scale and in a place as complex as the US and, and our insane, you know, our diversity is our benefit, but also our demise, right? We, we can't decide on anything and go in any direction for any length of time at all because we're so diverse. Yeah, I, I think de definitely there are some um companies that are um developing things like Upcelera I mentioned is a good one a good example um the uh you know BioNTech again is another you know great example um and because of the people there the, you know these are Nobel Prize winning uh chemists that have they're working like 80 hours a week mm -hmm. and they have their families in they come up with these things because they're driven with passion and to change uh, the world. So there are definitely people like, you know, those are the ones that 
that deserve whatever they get in terms of compensation because they've right. actually changed the world, but it's real. Mm. And so part of the problem now is you have to filter out what's real and what's not real. And that's, that's, that's probably the short answer to your question is that yeah. everything you really get nowadays is like, is you have to put a filter on yeah. and figure out, well, what's real and what's not real. Even when you're taking a drug and your doctor says, well, this is a drug I'm prescribing for you. You have to wonder again, is this in my best interest? Right. And, and should I research it? Should I question the doctor? Because the things that, that people did say, like our parents, they would never question a doctor ever. So if right. a doctor said, take this, then they took it. No questions asked. But nowadays, I think what people should be doing is they should be asking, um, is this doctor working with pharma? Mm -hmm. Is the doctor um, sort of biased because they're working too closely with pharma? Same thing with regulatory agencies. Sure. You know, why, why, why is there, because the pharma companies are very, very uh, powerful Pete, because they lobby and they, they have, they're, very, very, very powerful. And they can lobby government. They can lobby regulatory agencies. And you wonder, um, you know, are there better options available to me? And yeah. am I, why is this doctor in front of me prescribing this? And to question it, because I think that if, if you just, you know, carte blank, accept whatever's happening to you, then you're not taking control of your own destiny. So, um, and doing all that you have to do. Um, and so it, it's always becoming more of um, you becoming your own doctor. Yeah. And I was, <laughs> go ahead. You no, know, and that's where I think AI is going to be really powerful too. Is like yeah. if we somehow have um, the ability to have you're becoming your own doctor and you're able to diagnose and you're able to, that's where I think it's going to come more um broad i mean i would say broad scale is that look i can take a picture of my face and i can tell if this mole on my face is is messed up or not or right based on that and the best treatment is x y and z go see this dermatologist go get it removed and um because honestly right, right now the healthcare system is completely broken and and people are are uh, they don't have doctors they don't have family doctors they don't right. have you go to the hospital um and you're triaged and you're not like your limbs aren't dangling from your body then you have to wait six hours and, yeah and a lot of people don't understand that and so um so i think a lot of the the, the a lot of the ai type um tools are going to be super valuable in the future especially because you know healthcare is is broken now and there is no um, access to, to, um, um, doctors or medicines. And even if, even if we do develop the best medicines in the world, then, um, who's paying for those? Yeah. And some of these things are crazy. I mean, some of these gene therapies that I've mentioned, like the, the $2 million. Oh my gosh. And, yeah. and so, well, who, so if you don't have $2 million, then, um, you better hope your 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 insurance company will, will pay that bill. Yeah. And if they don't, then I mean that's a hello bankruptcy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The I, I was in jury duty a couple of months ago and they had a doctor who was being sued for malpractice. And it doesn't really matter why or what, but I was able to say during like during the jury, jury review process. Like, I'm probably going to find for the defendant or, you know, for the family, not for the defendant, for the family that's suing the doctor, because I know how hard it's got to be to keep up on all the peer reviewed research to maintain, to practice, do your, maintain your practice. I mean, this dude sat there for two full days just on jury selection. This is a doctor supposed to be doing doctoring stuff. Mm -hmm. You can really withstand so much of this, this time, you know, being calved off of your day before you're like, this is how I do it. This is the era I'm stuck in. 
and I do good practice and overall everything's going to work out fine. But at the fringes, there's going to be some lawsuits. And I was basically able to say like, there's no way that a doctor today can keep up with everything, no. whether it's homeopathic. I mean, I mean, if you had a reasonable solution, there's a, a center right down the road from us, you know, in hippie, hippie California, where they focus on things that are not traditional medicine and they make a lot of money and they write papers and people go to them all the time. And it is an alternate way to, look at your brain or whatever it is that the problem is because they focus just on that one thing and they don't just think how do we sell a drug out of it and they they are very successful right and so you do have to be on your own doctor and hopefully the ai isn't compromised by somebody's ad campaign where you're like going over to you know fisher and sons doctors for all your doctor needs <laughs> well that's the thing that's the thing it's like these places are are becoming more popular because people don't have access to traditional healthcare. Yeah. And so it's alternate healthcare because they, you know, they're, they have the capacity. Um, and you know, they're the point about the, the malpractice is eventually people are going to get sued because they're run down. Yeah. And they, you know, my wife, for example, I'm not saying she got sued, but it's like, she hates healthcare. Yeah. And, it's it's the same that as it as I just mentioned with the the accelerators. It's people are completely disrespectful. They they why is Aunt Aunt Jane sitting in the uh, waiting room for four hours? Why hasn't she got a new kidney? Why you know has an Uncle Bobby um, on moved up further on the transplant list? Why isn't this this that and the other? And you've seen these things. They're especially with mm -hmm. COVID. These healthcare practitioners, they're walking out of the hospital with security. And because it's just backlash against it. Why? They're the ones trying yeah. to they're the ones trying to help you. I mean, to yeah. me, those, those people are heroes. And they should be thanked every day. And we had in our neighborhood here, we had the um, you know, like in uh, other parts of the world, they had they were celebrating uh, healthcare practitioners. We had we were banging the pots right at 6 p.m. every night, you know, uh, to commemorate the healthcare workers and and so, um, but yeah, there's and doctors are human and yeah, run out of if 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 they're working 16 hour shifts and they go home and you know they're gonna make mistakes. So yeah, yeah. Hey, I don't want to keep you a whole lot longer, but I do want to let you talk about the uh, real estate side. So all this stuff is so frustrating. You're like, crap, can it? I think I can go out and just sell houses and actually make money. And yeah. so um, you mentioned earlier, you've already got a listing uh, when we were, before we started. So why that move? Why in that direction? And are you, are you in any way regretting it? It seems like you've got a lot of stuff on your back with all of the medical and pharma, pharma stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It, it's been a huge... Uh, game changer for me. So, you know, I think a lot of it's because I'm a lifelong learner and I've always been a lifelong learner. And, and so transitioning into something like this is actually relatively easy. And so that, for me, it always starts with a vision. And then, um, and whether I use the analogy of, of sport or being a seed passio, um, the, uh, um, the goal is always the same. It's winning. Mm. And, whether you win a drug approval or whether you you, you find it, um, and do, the opponent doesn't matter, and the game doesn't matter. The process right. is always the same. Mm. And so I want I wanted to be back in the in the CEO seat again. And so being a realtor at Sotheby's, you're basically the CEO of your own company. Right. And then with my broad net network, um, and again, I think in the in the biotech world. Um, it's not just the accelerators, but there's that same disrespect and same um, uh, treatment of of colleagues by people. And I was just mm -hmm. tired. It's like um, people are expecting so much from executives like myself yeah. for, for free. And, you know, I'll give you an example. Like, so um, I was the chief business officer of several companies. Um, and so, and after I was CEO at Stelvio and moved into a chief business officer role, and it was pretty good. It was, it was not cancer um, area. It was more of hair loss, which is still a problem, but it's not the same kind of issue. Um, right. 
And so I did a lot of great things for that company, you know, I helped, helped them do licensing deals and in, in the multi-million dollar range. And, um, and then everybody started a COVID company. <laughs> so we did too. So we kind of became fractional executives and I helped that company raise $2 million, which that money's vaporized. And I saw not a penny of that. So hmm. we access my network for free. Right. What I was doing. And then there's another company that was started, which is sort of a mix company for glaucoma. And, you know, the, the founder of the company, these are the guys that are making like, he's an ophthalmologist, started the company with another ophthalmologist. These are the kind of guys that are making like 1200, 1300 an hour. Um, because, you know, in the past, like a glaucoma surgery would take an hour and a half. And they mm -hmm. charge $680. Now they can do 12 of those in one hour and they still charge $680. So yeah. Math, 700 times 12 is 7,400 an hour. <laughs> That's a lot of money. Yeah. yeah. So what if I said to you face to face, you said, hey, Tilla, you know, you're doing a lot for this company, and, and, and but you're not doing anything for this mix company. And then I, I will, no, I'm not, right? And that's kind of abuse that because it was expected that I provide my my network um, for free for the benefit right. of the company, which they would pay me nothing in return for. And I'm like, what the hell? Am I, are you are you yeah. serious? Here's somebody who's looking at you know at 1,200 an hour asking me to you know because he said you're the best person for this. You know we need to raise a million dollars for this company, right? And, and you're the best person for this. Yeah, and. <laughs> <laughs> that's it. Yeah, no, I'm 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 done. So and so <laughs> the beauty, the beauty of the um the realtors because I have this global network of of doctors, bankers, lawyers, investors, entrepreneurs. That's why I got my first listing mm. in record time. You know, retired stockbroker, and I didn't even have to pitch them. Yeah. You know, people are like asking, well, how did your listing presentation go? Well, actually, we had lunch and went for a few drinks afterwards. And he gave me, you know, his his listing of his luxury home. Because you know why? He First of all, he trusts me. Right. Trust. It's amazing. That's, that's why I'm looking dressed like this, because they have a lot of, uh, I don't look like a realtor now, but they have a lot of fine art, mm -hmm. which is identifiable. So I, I've been helping them move that out of the home and obviously... Mm so that they don't become a target and um, of some bad people. We know there's some bad people out there and helping them move boxes and get rid of clutter. Um, and the second reason is because I'm likable. So he said, well, um, I trust you. You're likable. Yeah. I've known you for 15 years. And thirdly, you're competent. Yeah, right? So <laughs> you can deliver what you – whenever you deliver what you say you can deliver, then then – you have those three things and it's, it's, it's a no brainer. So, no -brainer. so I had this vision in July. I said, you know, um, it's, it's like, I can, I can be a great realtor. I have all of those things, but everything that I, you know, I reap everything that I sow. I don't give that away and be paid a fraction of that. Right. Because everything I, <laughs> everything, that I sell is based on my network. And, yeah. and I think, honestly, even if I take a hundred people in my network and say, look, can you give me your real estate business? Oh, yeah. I'm going to be a multimillionaire. <laughs> so, yeah. Why am I, why am I stressing out over um, being pistol whipped? Yeah. And respected and abused when <laughs> I could just, uh, I don't know if you watched a million dollar listing LA, but if I'm watching that, I'm loving it. It's like, it's fantastic. It's just, it's just, you know, it's such a breath of fresh air for me. It's so revitalizing. It's, it's, yeah. um, you know, I'm loving it. It's like a lot of the, um, a lot of my friends like um, are in luxury real estate and one of them um, sold 17 million in January. And his um, commission on that was he and his partners, so the two of them, 
uh, his commission on that was 450,000 for the month of January. Not a bad month. That's not a bad month. So, you know, with that, I can send my girls to school, my son to school and call it university. And I have three kids. And so, you know, you start, you start adding up the years and you say, well, where, where am I at? And yeah. more importantly for me, it's always been about my family and how do I, um, you know, support my family and, yeah. um, not become, uh, divorced and alcoholic or sued. <laughs> <laughs> A good goal. And and as we both know, because we both have lost siblings in the last couple of years, you know, the life that you have, anytime, anytime it could be gone, you know, and so we oh, got to yeah. enjoy these things now and, and truly value that. People who say work-life balance, they're always saying, I want to work less. I'm saying I'm going to default on the, I'm going to live more and be like, oh crap, I'm living, I'm living too well. Let me, let me back off. Yeah. <laughs> Do some more work. Because uh, is the the balance really should be on living? Hey, uh, anything in closing before I wrap this up? Okay. Um, well, yeah, no, it's been a pleasure to speak to you. I think that uh, you know, I love what you're doing, and I think you're uh, you, you you're deeply admired, and and you've got a great network. And oh, thanks, man. You're authentic, um, and you have a brilliant background. I mean, I love your background. It's so amazing. Yeah, and you've got this um, wonderful approach to, to um, communicating with people and it's so easy to warm up to you and so it's so natural um pete so, likable just like you yeah <laughs> <laughs> so keep doing what you're doing and and it, you know i'd love to um uh, stay in touch and figure out how um we can help each other and um uh, you know grow our businesses and um that sounds great main more stream i guess Stand by. Let me wrap this up. I'll be right back. Hey, thanks for watching the show. I really appreciate it. Right here, you can subscribe. Please do that. It makes the show grow. Hit that notification bell so you know which incredible guest is coming up next. Down below is the PayPal link. You can put a small subscription in. That is an enormous help. All that money goes right back into the show. And then right up over here are the next episodes you should listen to, curated by yours.